Hey, just before we get into the topic at hand, I'd like to go backtrack to your appearance yesterday. You were appearing not as a member of the Coronado School Board, but as a Coronado resident, and you were uh, responding to the basketball incident of Saturday night. In light of the Luke Cerna admission that he brought the tortillas into the your basketball arena, not for a premeditated racial or racism act, but as a means of celebrating the game, does that change your view on what happened Saturday? Well, Paul, as you know, I'm currently on the board of trustees for Coronado Unified School District. I'm unable to comment on an ongoing investigation. What I do know as an American citizen, as a Coronado resident, is that this national dialogue is happening in communities across the nation as we grapple with the racial realities. And also that ra uh, racial dialogue is not just black and white. It's also brown. It also includes Latinos. And what we saw here in San Diego and in Coronado is part of that reconciliation, that dialogue, that what may be celebratory in one area of the United States is clearly not understood as a celebratory act when a high school and or a community is largely Latino. And that is all about all I can comment on that, Paul. And, and fair enough. And and I I, just, I don't mean to press, but but there seems to be a, a race. There seems to be we always jump to the worst possible narrative. Maybe keeping our powder dry and waiting until all the facts come in might be uh, something we learn from this incident as well. Can you uh, expand on that, perhaps? What I do know is that the video that your uh, network did show was the immediate reaction by the Latino students as the tortillas were hurled. And when they fell at their feet, they themselves, and I quote, said that it was racist. That was the perception. That was the immediate reaction. That is how it was understood, according to the various clips played throughout national and local media like KUSI. So although I cannot comment further, I can base it based on what it was perceived to be, regardless of intent. All right, fair enough. Now to the topic at hand. Uh, could you, uh, just your overview of the Biden administration relaxing the policies of the prior administration? Well, uh, by trade, I'm an immigration attorney. So what this really means is that uh, he will reopen approximately 7,000 asylum cases. Those 7,000 asylum cases were terminated because either the person was unable to cross the border for their court hearings because they were stuck in Mexico or their cases were closed because they lacked legal counsel and were unable to further their asylum case. So what that means on a larger perspective in Texas, 17,000 asylum cases were likewise dismissed. Those people can register at United Nations run website called connect at United Nations HNCR.org, and they can register to re-enter the United States, even though they were potentially deported in absentia. What that means is that they never even appeared to proceed with their immigration court hearings and they were issued an order of deportation and the Biden administration seeking to undo the uh, Trump administration's remain in Mexico protocol will not only allow them a second run at their asylum case, but they will also enter the United States, remain in the United States what, for what potentially may be several years, because we do know that the immigration court system is backlogged. They currently have over over 1.3 million immigration cases. This will also be added to the docket. So there seems to be a mixed message coming out of the White House. On one hand, you have the vice president saying, do not come, speaking to people perhaps coming across the border. And then on the other hand, you seem to have this opening of the doors and come in as fast as you can. Which are we to believe? Well, Paul, and it even gets even more complicated. Every day I have clients that have been longtime residents of the United States that are unable to become legalized because Congress is still grappling with immigration reform. The Democrats have advanced immigration policy reform, but the Republicans are wary of it precisely because the border is yet not under control. There's chaos at the border. And now admitting more people to the front of the line makes even my own clients irate because while they have been patiently waiting through the Bush, Obama, uh, uh, Trump, and now the Biden administration for meaningful immigration reform, allowing them to stay, work, and become legalized here, they're put to the back of the line to give preference to asylum seekers. Can we do both at the same time? 
Absolutely. But logistically, administratively, even or judicially, uh, we know that the immigration system is not only strained, it's unable to proceed at this point in time. So something very hopeful and optimistic is that Kamala Harris is set to visit the border. Finally, after having been deemed by to be the immigration czar by the Biden administration. So hopefully not only can she understand the root causes, but also what works, what doesn't work, what the reality is, and that there's still currently children, even here in San Diego and downtown at a detention facility known as a San Diego Convention Center. It's still unacceptable that these children have not been reunited with their parents and that we still have them here in the downtown facility. These children are scared and we also have reports from Texas and even some in San Diego that these children are uh, falling into depression. Some have even attempted suicide. This is unacceptable. It's a failure and even though the benevolence of our community leaders in offering them housing and assistance and medical care is fantastic. The overall arch of this story is that there needs to be immigration reform, Congress needs to act, and we need to pressure the Biden administration to do something for over the undocumented immigrants currently in California, in San Diego, that are uh, most often the essential workers we all relied on when we were staying home. You, you brought up the vice president making the decision, to, I believe, yet tomorrow, right? She's going to be in El Paso? or oh, Of all the spots to pick along the border, why, why El Paso? It seems to have the greatest influx as well, not only of migrants entering um, or attempting to enter through the Rio Grande Dave Valley sector, but also the greatest amount of expulsions. And also there's a huge amount of migrant uh, shelters there as well child migrant centers as well. And she will, and I hope that she comes and visits us here at San Diego, because of course we do have portions of the border wall that were constructed under the Trump administration as well. And we have a different reality here. We have the second, one of the second most violent cities in the world alongside San Diego known as Tijuana, where approximately 1,500 migrants reported being unable to enter the United States for their court hearings because they suffered a kidnapping, a rape, assault, or other types of misadventures, which stopped them from even being able to enter the United States the day of their court. So hopefully she does come and views everything that's going along the border from the U.S. perspective, looking towards Mexico. As for the next time we have uh, this chat, I, I, I want to talk about what would be the three or five things that you would do if you were given a Harry Potter wand and you could change something. I'd like to know what your plan would be to, to solve what has been a crisis now for since as long as I've been politically aware that we've been talking about this for a long time. I'd like to know what you would change. So uh, we'll have that conversation the next time we chat, okay? Looking forward to it. Esther Valdez-Clayton, everybody.